True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Well, she was delightful. She was, she was happy, and she was a typical little girl, um, very athletic, you know, in every sport, cheerleading, everything she could be in, she was in. Very tender-hearted. She was one of the type of children that if she just thought she upset you, she would immediately tear up, and you know, she's very, very thoughtful and kind and considerate. They kept Shanda confined in the trunk of a vehicle. They would stop at various times and would torture her. There was also testimony that one of the girls would keep her foot on the gas pedal and rev the engine to subdue the noises that Shanda would make during her torturing. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. This episode is sponsored by Madison Reed. Madison Reed is revolutionizing the way women color their hair with gorgeous salon quality, multi-dimensional hair color delivered to your door on your schedule. With Madison Reed, you can have the look of professional hair color without spending the time or the money. Join the hundreds of thousands of women, me included, who've tried and who love Madison Reed. Just visit madison-reed.com and get 10% off plus free shipping on your first color kit with promo code BREWERY. That's madison-reed.com and promo code BREWERY. Okay, before we get into today's case, let me just mention the contest we're having. We at Tie Grabber have a new contest for our True Crime Brewery listeners. Before we go to the 2018 CrimeCon next spring, we want to create some new t-shirts. So what we need from our creative and artistic listeners is a new t-shirt logo and design but we don't have any limitations on the design you create. In fact, we're really excited to see what you can come up with. Yeah, we've already gotten some great ones. We sure have. Now, the winner's going to get a t-shirt, of course, but also a monetary prize of $250. We're going to start the contest now, or or we actually have started the contest, and it's going to run until February 1st, 2018. So to enter, just send us your design in JPG or PNG format with a maximum size of 10 MB to truecrimebrewery at tiegrabber.com. Some of our entries so far have included the image and design on a shirt, which is great, especially if you're including something on the back of the shirt. Yeah, but, like um, like our website or something. Yeah. Or some kind or of a little, little saying or something. Right, like on our other ones, we have Meet Me at the Quiet End. So. Yeah. Yeah. But in addition to that, please send a file of the image alone so we'll be able to use it with the printing company in the case that you win. May the best true crime artist win. Good luck. All right. Thanks. We've all done stupid things for peer pressure. It can be harmless, like influencing the way we dress or the way we wear our hair. Sometimes it involves drinking and other high-risk behavior. It often plays a part in bullying in high school and junior high with a teen or group of teens encouraging abusive behavior against one of their peers. Today we're talking about an extreme case of peer pressure, though, which led to the torture and murder of a 12-year-old girl by four teenage girls. 12-year-old Shanda Scher was cute and friendly. She lived in Madison, Indiana, in 1992 when her murder attracted international attention. Her killers were unlikely criminals. Shanda had left her house willingly with them. So how did this typical teenage adventure lead to such horrific violence and end up in a murder? The role of peer pressure or mob mentality was definitely a factor, but there were other factors that influenced what happened that night, including some abusive histories and dysfunctional childhood environments of some of the perpetrators. So we'll talk about the crime of torture and murder against Shanda and examine the influences, including the home lives, of the girls who actually were involved in this crime. In this episode of True Crime Brewery, Mean Girls. And what do we have for a beer review? Today's beer is a beer called Bitches Bank, brewed by 18th Street Brewery in Gary, Indiana. Now, did you pick that name because these 
Mean Girls Were Bitches? No. Oh, it's kind of fitting. It is. That was unintentional. Okay. Um, and I, I would just mention the 18th Street Brewery also has a brewery in Hammond, Indiana. So Gary and Hammond are where these guys are located. So Bitches Bank is a Russian imperial stout. We've had these before. Mm -hmm. Many times. I'll just mention that Russian imperial stouts are the king of stouts. They tend to be highly alcoholic, usually not too hoppy. They have a very pronounced malt presence, roasted malt, chocolate malt, even kind of a burnt malt. And they can have some dark fruit in there also. So this one, Bitches Bank, is a 12% alcohol by volume beer. It pours in a pitch black color with a nice brown head, has a cinnamon and dark chocolate aroma, and the taste follows the nose pretty perfectly. Uh, some cinnamon, a lot of dark chocolate, and actually in the taste is a hint of some vanilla. Mmm, sounds nice. really yummy. It is. Great beer. Although some of them sound yummier than they actually are. It's kind yeah. of like coffee. Some coffee smells delicious and it's not so great. Well, that's true. Yeah. And, and you have to filter it through me who's a big stout lover. Right, yeah, So, because you love it a lot more than I do. I sometimes do. Yeah, all right, well, let's open it up, and then we can head down to the quiet end. We've got some activity down there I wanted to bring up to you. Okay, I see that we have snifters today. That pleases me. Let's head on down. Let's do it. There's uh, kind of um, some crazy stuff going on down at the noisy end. What is that? Lots of bottles, lots of people. Yeah. Well, did you see the, the sign? No. At, at the front of the bar? Nope. Tonight is a vertical tasting of Bigfoot. What does that mean? So what that means, well, Bigfoot is a barley wine, and, and we've had those a few times. And it tends to be a higher alcoholic beer, and those, those kinds of beers sometimes can be aged. So a vertical tasting is taking the same beer from different years and seeing how it evolves over time. So what they're doing tonight, they have a 10-year vertical of Bigfoot. It's from 2008 to 2017. Nice. So they're, they're getting small sips, well, small pours. I don't want to say just sips because you get a little more than a sip, but everybody's getting a, a small pour of each year. All right. And you, you can see how it goes through the years. Oh, so can you really? You, you can. And that, don't, once you have like the first three or four, do you have to like clear your palate with water or a cracker or something? Well, yeah. You have to keep drinking water and having some simple food. Okay. I mean, you're not, you're not drinking a ton of beer, so you're not getting blitzed. No, no. Uh, but you do want to be able to be, you want to be able to uh, detect the nuances of each year. Interesting. So is somebody going to write this up, do you think? Oh, probably. Yeah. Interesting, because I know you like Bigfoot. I do. And, yeah. And I've, I've participated in verticals of Bigfoot, not, not for a 10-year vertical, but I've done a 5-year vertical. Yeah. And it's, it's quite fun. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. When we talk about what happened to Shanda, it's really heartbreaking, isn't it? It's a terrible more, story. More than heartbreaking. Yeah. And it also boggles the mind to try and understand such cruelty and such disregard for human suffering by these seemingly pretty normal young people. I mean, at least some of them. So let's go back to their childhood environments and their backgrounds and just get kind of a feel for who these perpetrators are and okay. who Shandra was. Good idea. Okay. So the girl who wanted to kill Shanda and who set off the events was a girl named Melinda Loveless. Uh, her mother, Marjorie, married Larry Loveless in the mid-60s. He was 20, and she was only 16. So that's a little on the young side, wouldn't you say? It's illegal. Right? Mm-hmm. Now, Marjorie believes she's living in a fairy tale. Larry was a handsome guy. He had a brand new 66 Olds to pick her up for their dates. They got married in a big church in New Albany, Indiana. Marjorie wore a classic white wedding gown. The entire wedding party, which looked a bit too young for marriage, wore white. And Marjorie was full of hope for her future. She and Larry had already rented an apartment near her parents, and she was excited to decorate it in her own style. They honeymooned in nearby Clarksville at a Colonial Inn. 
Yeah, so after the wedding, they go to the inn, and Marjorie said she felt really special because Larry carried her over the threshold. She had these fancy negligees, and they had a lot of sex. In fact, Larry's preoccupation with sex worried her right from the get-go. He didn't take her out once during the honeymoon, not even out for dinner. All he wanted to do was stay in bed and have sex the entire time, occasionally having some food delivered to the room. So Marjorie stayed in high school, so I give her credit for that. She wanted to be a nurse one day. Larry worked at the fine shirt factory, and he did pay their bills. They didn't have much money, but she was sure that would change. They were still young and working towards improving their lives. But things did change in the first year of their marriage, and not for the better. Yeah, we're, we're going to find out that Larry is a world-class pervert. Yes, yep. And abusive. And abusive. And uh, there's several other disparaging things we can say about him. But he was a total shit. Yes. He was extremely jealous. He accused her of cheating on him. And he followed her to school, confronting her in front of the other kids and embarrassing her. And it got so bad that she eventually dropped out without getting her diploma. And I would just say he probably wanted that. That was probably his goal. Yeah. He, he wanted to be in control. Right. So he soon after began to cheat on Marjorie. Larry's brother Danny and his girlfriend came to spend a weekend with them. Marjorie caught Larry on their bedroom floor on top of Danny's girlfriend. She saw them kissing, and she believed he was sexually assaulting her. Well, I would think so. Lying on top of her on the floor? In your bedroom. Yeah. So she confronted Larry, but he didn't think it was a big deal. Yeah. So in 1967, Larry was drafted into the Army... And he was sent to Vietnam when Marjorie was pregnant with their oldest, Michelle. So Marjorie moved in with her parents so she wouldn't be all alone. Larry wrote to her from Vietnam, and he faithfully sent her money. Once she went to meet Larry for a week in Hawaii, leaving Michelle with her parents. But Larry spent much of their time together accusing her of cheating on him back home while he was away. So that kind of spoiled things. What a sweetheart. It was supposed to be this week together after him being in Vietnam. Yeah. And he and they, just... they haven't uh, seen each other for quite some time. Yeah. And all he's going to do is rag on her for cheating. Right. Which wasn't true. No. No. So he had six months left to serve, and he got to return to the United States. Uh, the family moved to Fort Worth, Texas. Marjorie's pretty homesick. She'd never been out of Indiana. Larry often stayed out all night, and Marjorie felt like he was seeing other women. Larry had all his teeth pulled after telling the dentist that his back teeth were bothering him. Dennis said, nah, you don't need to do that. Teeth look good. Larry wanted them pulled out anyway, as long as the Army was paying the bills. So the dentist did that. Larry got dentures. He was pretty happy with that. So any idea where that comes from? I have no That is clue. so strange. Isn't it? Yeah. You know, just pull them all. I don't know. That's odd to me. Larry wanted to have sex every day. He liked to do it in front of their baby, Michelle, which really disturbed Marjorie. And most of their arguments at that point in their relationship was about her unwillingness to have sex when the baby was awake. And at this point, they were living in a hotel. Now, Larry forced himself on Marjorie if she refused to have sex with him, and she started to see that he really had a mean streak. He could be cruel. He once beat a man with a broomstick because he had flirted with Marjorie, and he threatened to leave her in Texas with nothing while he returned to Indiana. So at this point, she's realizing this wasn't the man that she thought she'd married. She'd made a mistake. Well, you know, she was 16 years old when they got married. They hadn't been going out that long. So she didn't really know him. No. I mean, dating is a totally artificial environment. That's true. Right? Right. But she's finding out what kind of a person he is. And probably if she'd broken it off then, things might have been better for everybody. Possibly. But I mean, hindsight's good. I know. But she stuck it out. Yeah. So Marjorie's relieved. They did finally return to New Albany, Indiana. And Larry's treated like a hero because he served in Vietnam. He developed an attitude that he had fought for his country and he could do whatever he wanted. Larry bragged about killing men, women, and children in Vietnam. He also said he was very good at torturing people. And besides all that, he had a frightening fascination with guns. He collected them, he insisted that Marjorie go to the gun range with him, and he even slept with a gun under his pillow. That would make me nervous. 
Especially, me, me nervous you know, too. <laughs> especially if he's been in Vietnam, he could have flashbacks. And she already knows that he can be mean. And what kind of person would brag about killing women and children and even men? I mean, why would you brag about that? I have no idea. Except no. to show what a tough guy he is. Right. Now, Larry's mother had been obsessively neat, and Larry was the same way. He would go into a rage if anything was out of place. He was not a good father. He would hit the baby for crying, and he w really did a lot of beating. During potty training, he would hit her. Now, when Larry changed her diapers or bathed her, Marjorie thought he touched her private parts inappropriately. That really makes my skin crawl. Isn't that a big, huge red flag? Yeah, but I it's mean, kind of like she doesn't trust her own instincts or judgment. Yeah, I know. But here she's already caught this guy trying to have sex with a relative's girlfriend. Yeah. And now he's touching the girl. Baby. The, the baby. And it just... Ah. I mean, she, she really felt wrong to her, but she didn't say anything. Yeah. Now, Larry molested Marjorie's 13-year-old sister when she visited, and she would never visit again. And around that same time, he was having an affair with a neighbor. Now, the neighbor woman confessed to Marjorie, and Marjorie confronted Larry. And that was when serious physical abuse started. By now, Marjorie was pregnant with their second child, Melissa, though, and she didn't feel like she could leave. You know, one of the things Larry liked to do was watch his wife have sex with other men. Well, that sounds like a good pastime. <laughs> so he used to take Marjorie out to bars to find other men. Then he began bringing home friends from work to share Marjorie with. He forced Marjorie into threesomes where he would have intercourse with her and the man. When Michelle was four, she walked in on one of these episodes, clearly horrified. I can't imagine now a four-year-old. A little four-year-old, and you go in on, in on a threesome. Yeah, with Ick. your parents. Yuck. Yeah. And so, she was probably being molested, too. Probably. Because he was touching her inappropriately when he changed her diapers. So that's a huge red flag. So now they have two daughters, and their names are Michelle and Melissa, and they're both terrified of him. Right, because he threatened them, he beat them regularly, and sexually abused them. Yes. So in 1975, Michelle had her third daughter, Melinda. By now, she'd gotten her high school diploma, and she was working as a practical nurse. She worked all the time and had her 10-year-old niece babysit her three girls. Larry molested all of the girls, including the niece. She stopped coming over to babysit after Larry caught her hair on fire, and her mother found out what was going on at their house. So that's it. But no, still, no, no one went to the authorities. Yeah, I can't believe it. Yeah. but It's the 70s. Again, it's, it's another time. Right. When Melinda was four years old, Marjorie contracted encephalitis, which is a brain infection. Yeah, I wonder how she got that. Well, most of them are viral type things, you know, so you get bitten by mosquitoes and stuff like that to carry, uh -huh. say, West Nile virus or other viruses. Mm -hmm. But anyway, she got it. She's in the hospital for a long time, and when she did return home, she was pretty disabled. So all of this time while she's in the hospital and recovering, Larry's alone with the girls. That's horrifying. And as Marjorie's recovered, she's learning that Larry's having affairs with several women. So not just one woman, but several. Which seems like he was kind of doing that from the beginning. Oh, no kidding. And these guys he's bringing home from work, he's having sex with them too. So he'll pretty much have sex with anybody. Yeah. Now here's, here's my difficulty with all this. Instead of divorcing him, Marjorie begins to have affairs of her own. So I don't, don't understand that. No, and that just makes things worse for the, do for the children. Yeah, the girls got older. Michelle and Melissa learned to avoid Larry, but Melinda was very passive about this, and she allowed him to sleep with her. I know. She's a little girl. I mean, we can't blame her. What could she do? Yeah. So we get this sick dynamic going. Larry's beginning to treat Melinda as his girlfriend or wife. He's bragging about how pretty she was, and he's calling Marjorie ugly. Yeah. Melinda actually slept in the same bed with Larry into her teenage years, and she told her parents she was gay. And then she was allowed to have girlfriends come and spend the night with her. Larry got a job at the post office, but then he was fired for destroying and failing to deliver mail. So this was a big deal. He actually was just throwing mail in his basement and letting it pile up. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he'd periodically go down and 
rip up things and toss them out. It's just, yeah, yeah, until <laughs> it finally cow. got figured out. But that's that's a major crime. I don't know why he didn't get prosecuted. I, I don't mean, know either. That's terrible, but that's what he was doing. He was just not honest about things and a very dysfunctional situation there in the Loveless home. It's a horrible upbringing. It is, it is. So you've got parents that are sleeping around. One of them is physically and sexually abusing you. The other one, I think, is also physically abusive. The mother, certainly verbally abusive. The mother's abusive, too? To the kids. Oh, yeah. okay. Oh, it's, it's, it's just, just a, everything is going on there. Every bad thing life. you could think of. Yeah. So it's easy to feel some sympathy for Melinda. I think so. Although it gets tougher when you get to what she did to little Shanda. It, it does, but... Um, you know, I can see how she'd be pretty fucked up with her upbringing. I know, right? That's true. It's very true. Well, Marjorie did finally divorce Larry, and by that time, though, Melinda was already 14. And it was after the divorce when Melinda was introduced to Amanda Heverin. So Amanda looked and dressed like a boy, and she thought Melinda was very pretty. In fact, all of the girls said that Melinda was exceptionally pretty. Melinda thought Amanda reminded her of her father, who had left after the divorce. And you know how dysfunctional it is. Melinda was mad at her mom when her father left. Oh, well, sure. What is that? Well, in, in his own sick way, he was the one paying more attention to her. Right? Yeah. So she bonded or identified more closely with him than with her mother. And he was probably bad-mouthing Marjorie. And for sure. You, you can figure that when the divorce occurred, he did everything he could to run down Marjorie, right? Right, that's true. So Amanda and Melinda became very close. They were inseparable, but they also fought a lot. And Melinda, not surprisingly, suffered from depression. After attempting to hang herself and overdose, she was put into counseling and her last appointment was in May of 1991. She never admitted to the counselor that she was molested by her father, and she never forgave her mother for divorcing her father. Her mother remarried, but Melinda didn't get along with him. At age 15, she hung out with Amanda, but she also had some wilder friends who she hung out with at night, drinking and partying over in Louisville. Yeah, just across the border. So let's move on to Shanda. Okay. So she and her mom moved to New Albany in 1991, and she registered for public school there. She used to live in Louisville, and while living there, she had attended Catholic school, and she was pretty excited to be going to a public school where she wouldn't have to wear a uniform. Now, Shanda was an easygoing 12-year-old, liked to go to the mall, talk on the phone. Her parents were divorced. But she had a good relationship with both her parents and the step-parents because they had both remarried. Right. I think that when they moved there, her mom was in the midst of getting her second divorce. Okay. Yep. Now, like most 12-year-olds, Shanda wanted to be a teenager. So she wore some makeup, and she was pretty well-developed for her age, so she was able to fool people that she was older. Her mother didn't allow her to date or to have a boyfriend, but you know how that is. Kids find a way. Kids will always find a way. When she visited her father on weekends, she had a bit more freedom. He wasn't quite as strict with her. Now, in late August, Shanda began her classes at Hazelwood Junior High. She was a pretty blonde with a beautiful smile, and she attracted the attention of both the girls and the boys. Amanda thought Shanda was cute, and that really bothered Melinda. Now, Melinda started to pick on Shanda and make fun of her in the school cafeteria. Sure. Melinda's jealous. Yes. So about the same time, Amanda tried to break up a fight between Shanda and Amanda's cousin Nathan. Both the girls got school suspension for one week. This is in-school suspension. So they go to school, but not classes. They sit in a study hall type of environment. Yeah, I don't understand that as a punishment. Me either. But that's but, a whole other topic. Yeah. So Melinda was jealous, and she purposely got into trouble also, so she would have the same school detention. Right, right. Now, despite Melinda's efforts to intervene, Amanda and Shanda became friends. They ended up talking on the phone every day, and eventually became very good friends. 
Yeah, Amanda asked for the combination to Shanda's school locker, and then she started leaving her notes and gifts. She began to leave hints with her about being a lesbian and being romantically interested. And she asked Shanda if she kind of liked girls too, and if she thought that Amanda was cute. So there's some flirtation here. Definitely some flirtation. But these girls are older, right? Yeah. Shanda's 12 and they're... They're 14 and 15. Yeah. Maybe even 16. Yeah, because... Maybe 15 and 16. 15 and 16 sounds right. Yeah. Because somebody had a driver's license. Right. Yep. So Melinda's getting more jealous and she sent a note to Shanda asking why she's speaking with Amanda behind her back. She told Shanda that Amanda was hers and Shanda needed to find her own boyfriend or girlfriend. Amanda seemed torn between Melinda and Shanda. Shanda also had a boy she liked, and his name was Ray, and she was seen holding his hand at school. So we've got kind of love triangles over the, all over the place here. Yeah. So, Mel yeah, Melinda and Amanda had been lovers and friends for about a year at that point. So Melinda has identified herself as gay for some time. Yes, a couple of years. And Amanda also is. Yes. Amanda looks like a boy. Right. Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're gay. No, and it doesn't. But I think that's part of Shanda's attraction to Amanda, because I don't think Shanda was a lesbian, because she had these boyfriends. But Amanda looked like a cute boy. Well, I'd just say at 12, to me, it's a little difficult to figure out what your sexuality is. Well, sure. But I think most people have an idea by then. They, they might have an idea. Right. But they still might experiment. Absolutely. Try different people combinations. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if we mentioned, but in Melinda's family, both her older sisters were out as lesbians. Yeah, yeah. I don't think we said that. So, all three daughters. Yeah. Well, that's unusual. It is. So, I wonder. Now, do you, is there... I'm just posing this. I don't think we know the answer. But all three of these girls were physically and sexually abused by their father. Is, is that a factor in determining sexuality? If, I don't think it is for most people. Sexual but I, abuse? But I could see if there's a lot of abuse that you might be turned off by men, and I think that's a thing. But we don't know where sexuality comes from. It's a combination of things. But I could see right. that abuse being a contributing factor. I can too. Yeah. So... Melinda's feeling like she's being ignored by Amanda as Amanda's spending more attention and time on Shanda, the new girl. When Shanda and Amanda went to a school dance together that September, Melinda was really hurt. And when the dance ended, she confronted Amanda and slapped her, and she warned Shanda to stay away from her girlfriend. Yeah, so October rolls around. Melinda's getting more and more distraught about this relationship between Shanda and Amanda. Right. So she goes to talk to the assistant principal. And she tells the principal that she was gay and her mother wouldn't accept her. Now, the principal had no idea how to handle what she was telling him. <laughs> gave, yeah, yeah. Gave her a pamphlet on interracial dating and called her mother. That's a big help. Yeah, so there's someone really unequipped to take care of things the way yeah. that they should. Well, it's 25 years ago, but still. But still, interracial dating, what does that have to do with anything? Zero. So Marjorie told the principal that Melinda was in counseling, and that was that. That was it. He dropped it. No follow-up, nothing. So that's pretty piss poor. That's pretty lame. It sure is. But Melinda, she's still trying to break apart Amanda and Shanda. She's kind of obsessed with this. And she told Amanda that Shanda was easy and had many, many boyfriends trying to turn her off. That's right. Now, at the same time... Shanda's mother really didn't like Melinda or Amanda. She felt they were both a bad influence, and they were causing Shanda's grades to drop. Sure. And so, they're older. Yeah. I mean, two or three years older. That's a big deal when but you're 12. That's, that's a lot. Yes. High school. Versus junior high. Junior high. Yeah. Or late junior high. But she, she didn't like these girls. So the, the girls are forbidden from calling Shanda. And Shanda's mom hired a tutor to help Shanda improve her grades. Yeah, this was a drastic change from what I read because she was an excellent student. She was doing very well. And then she moved to the school and things were going downhill fast. But there's not the structure and the discipline that there was in the Catholic school. 
There isn't. But as you said, she was a very good student. Yes. And, and a very uh, school-spirited person. I mean, she did lots of clubs, mm -hmm. participated in school sports. Kind of a happy, well-adjusted person. Yeah, so you would think. But the thing is, I'd like to know why she was in the same school with these older girls. Were they just sharing the cafeteria? Or did the classes go from 12-year-olds to 15-year-olds in the same classes? Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, it was kind of a strange junior high situation there. Maybe it was a... Because this is not a huge town. So maybe the junior high and the high school were in one building. Yeah. Separate wings or something. Could be. And there was a common cafeteria. Could be. But anyway, they they found a way to get together. Yeah. So it was Tuesday, October 22nd. Amanda agreed to skip school with Melinda and her friend Carrie Pope. Now they spent the day hanging out and shopping in Louisville. And when they got home, they were in big trouble. Amanda's father searched her room and he found some sexually explicit notes between Amanda and Melinda. So he actually went to the authorities and requested a restraining order against Melinda. He does not like her around his daughter either. He doesn't. A couple days later, October 24th, was the beginning of Harvest Homecoming weekend. And Shanda and Amanda went to the haunted house display together with Shanda's father, Steve, and Steve's wife, Shannon. They spent the day playing games and going on rides. And Steve allowed Amanda to spend the night at their house. So it didn't take long for Melinda to hear about Harvest Homecoming. I'm sure it didn't. Word <laughs> travels fast, right? Yes. She called her friends ranting about Shanda. She wanted to beat her up. She wanted to kill her, she said. She confronted Shanda at school, and many of her friends were backing her up. So Melinda's kind of a leader. She's the lead mean girl. Yeah. She was a smart girl. You don't think so? Well. thought she had a fairly high IQ. No, or no, that was um, Lori. Lori, Lori okay. had the... Skip Hi, that. You. Now, Shanda toughened up, and she began to fight back against these girls that are ganging up on her. Yeah, she wasn't taking any shit. No. And Shanda and Amanda were spending time together on the weekends when she's with her dad. Their friendship had become more of a romantic relationship at this point, and Amanda started sending her flowers and love letters. So Amanda's kind of in love with Shanda, it seems like. Although Shanda's mother would say that Amanda was very manipulative of Shanda. Almost like a predator. Well, yeah. But I don't know if she's old enough to be a predator, but there is like a three-year age difference. There is. So October 28th rolls around. It's Melinda's birthday. Melinda is expecting to get something from Amanda, but Amanda didn't call her or give her a gift. And this very much upset Melinda. Yes. She's feeling ignored and betrayed. Now, in November, Shanda's mother and father transferred her to Our Lady of Perpetual Help in New Albany. Shanda agreed that she needed a new start, but she continued her communications with Amanda. On November 22nd, Amanda tried to get Shanda into a Friday night Hazelwood Junior High dance. Melinda saw them and ran up to her in a rage. She said to Shanda, if you even try to talk to Amanda again, I'm going to fucking kill you. So there you go. Now, of course, I think teenagers say this kind of thing to each other fairly regularly, and it doesn't happen. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. So December 12th comes along, and Amanda decided to type a letter to Shanda. She said that she would always be there for her, but she knew that Shanda liked a boy, and she wanted to break up with her. So Shanda wrote back a long letter complaining about her Catholic school and asking about her friends at Hazelwood. Now, during the winter, Melinda pretended to be lovers with Carrie Pope. This is an attempt to make Amanda jealous. So Carrie's this tough type of person, half her hair shaved off. She considered herself a hardcore punk, wearing black clothes, silver studs, spikes, the whole nine yards. So Lori Tackett left her home in Madison to stay with Carrie and Melinda. So we're going to talk about Lori some more. But Lori's the new addition to the group. Right, right. She's attracted to Carrie. She stayed with her at her grandmother's house. On the third day of Lori's stay, Carrie took 30 speed tablets and was freaking out. Lori thought she could channel spirits, and she was able to calm Carrie down to get her through the night. 
Now, that's a whole suspicious story. She takes 30 tablets of what? Some amphetamine type of drug? Yeah. Like for attention deficit disorder or something? Well, or it could be like, you know, like a street, some street speed, yeah. Whatever. You take 30. You're, you're not going to get talked down. Well, no. No. So. But it would wear off. Well, I'm thinking she didn't really take the 30 tablets. Well, you never know. Because otherwise she wouldn't have been able to be talked down. Well, yeah, but if you're talking to someone and the drug's wearing off, you don't know that it's just the drug wearing off. It's not what you're saying. Yeah, I'm still thinking that she didn't really take that much. Possible. Anyway, it's a just a small point. Now, if you're a True Crime Brewery fan, you probably love listening to true crime podcasts like we do. My latest obsession is cults. Cults have mystery, manipulation, and murder. What really goes on behind the closed doors of a cult? What is the psychology behind cults? What kind of people are susceptible to join? And what kind of people start them up? Cults is the name of a new podcast that answers these questions with biographical profiles of the leaders and the followers. The hosts analyze evidence with a team of researchers, and they expose some little-known facts. So check out their episodes about the Manson family and Heaven's Gate. Heaven's Gate was the ones that wore the sneakers, right? They thought they were going to be brought up in a spaceship, and they all wore yeah. Nike sneakers. Weren't they waiting for the meteor or comet or something? Yeah, but they all committed suicide. Yeah. Now there's a new episode every Tuesday, just like True Crime Brewery. So you can visit the quiet end, and then you can spend some time learning about the People's Temple and more cults. Visit Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts and search for cults. Now that's C-U-L-T-S. You can also listen to cults at parcast.com slash cults. That's P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com slash cults. And you can listen to that now well, that after you listen to this. Yes. But that sounds interesting. <laughs> yes. I've always been fascinated by cults. Yeah. Well, we're talking in this case about mob mentality. Right. Similar uh, things. Yeah. Okay. So Carrie told Laurie about a place called Witch's Castle. Now, the legend of Witch's Castle is that you can hear a little girl laughing in the woods and loud thumps. Now, this, this is a place nearby where all of these girls live. So it's yeah. someplace they can visit. Yeah. People have said they've seen a white mist moving very fast in what looked like the living room. However, only the foundation and a fireplace remain of the main house. Now, just up the hill, behind the main house, is a small shack surrounded by a ditch and a cliff. There used to be a basement in the main house, but it's been filled in now with dirt and rock. There's a small door on each side of the room also in the room with the fireplace. Now, they've people have claimed to see a small girl, seven, eight years old, wearing a white dress. This is a very spooky place. It is, but you don't buy any of that. It's no, all people's not. imaginations. It's a, you know, it's a ruined stone house, so it's got that look about it anyway. Well, it's spooky. It reminds me kind of like, remember the Blair Witch Project? Yeah. That was scary. Right. Even though you know it's not real, it yeah, still this, scares the bejesus place is out of you. Out in the woods, and you come across a stone or remains of a stone house. Well, I wouldn't go there. It's creepy. I wouldn't either. Well, just down the street, they have that um, haunted woods walk where you can go down and walk through the woods, and there's zombies and all kinds of scary things in the woods. Down our street. Yes. Yeah, I'm not going there. That's what I was going to say. Is we we talk tough, but we're afraid to go to that. <laughs> So Laurie says, oh, I want to see this castle. And it ended up being a regular meeting place for the kids, the girls. Yeah, yeah. Now Laurie, she had problems. She was not a happy child. Her mother was fanatically religious, and her father refused to attend the church at all. Now Laurie belonged to a fundamental church with her mother and her younger brother. Now this church didn't believe in medicine or doctors. So Lori suffered her multiple ear infections with only prayer. Now her teeth came in early, and she had this jaw disorder, which she wasn't allowed to have surgery for. You know what that is? Well, the, the only thing I can think of is that her wisdom teeth came in. Oh. And, you know, there's usually not enough room for them. 
Well, she had chronic headaches from it. Oh, sure. Yeah. Because you'll have, with, with erupted wisdom teeth, if there's no room, you'll have TMJ pain and headaches. Well, that could make you an unhappy person right there. I'd be really cranky. It certainly could. Yeah. Now, Lori left the church when she was just 14. She was caught wearing jeans soon after, and her mother beat her so badly that the school called in human services. Now, Lori was allowed to stay at home, but a social worker would be checking in on her regularly, they said, and there would be unannounced visits. But these visits only lasted for a few months, so Lori was kind of failed by the system. She was. Now, when she was 15, she began to seriously rebel. She wanted to be the antithesis of her mother, so she began wearing black and drinking whiskey. She became fascinated with witches and sorcerers. Her mother told her she was possessed by demons, and her father was this passive guy that really wasn't defending her or being any help at all. Yeah, he's just way in the background here. I hate that. So the church that they belonged to didn't believe in psychiatrists, so Lori was taken to the altar where church members spoke in tongues and laid hands on her. I didn't think they'd believe in psychiatrists if they don't believe in antibiotics. Or physicians anyway. Right. So, yeah. Kind of sounds like uh, Scientology in a way. Although, you know, it's cults again, weird things. It's cults. Yep. So when her brother read her diary, he found out that she was claiming to be gay. And this time Lori's told us she'd go straight to hell. Yeah. So she was avoided by most of her school because her dramatic appearance uh, and her sexuality. Her only real friend was Hope, a girl named Hope Rippy, who she treated as a little sister. So this Hope was an average student, didn't get any trouble. When Lori was thinking of dropping out of school, Hope was worried about her. Yeah, Lori wasn't Hope's best friend. Her best friend was Tony Lawrence. Tony was the baby of her family, and she was spoiled by her parents. She was short with Coke bottle glasses, and she was a good girl, a little bit entitled, an average student. So together, they were like sisters. They volunteered together at a local nursing home, reading to patients. They seemed like good girls. They did. Now, when she's in the eighth grade, Tony had been raped by a boy who had attacked her. Now, she wasn't going to report it, but then her mother found a note she had written to a girlfriend about the incident. So her parents took her to the police department, wanting to press charges, but the police would only issue a restraining order against the boy. Now, I'm not sure why that is. I don't know. Maybe because they had no evidence? Because Possibly. Because it had been a while? So the parents took Tony to see a counselor. She went one time and said, that's it. Yeah. But the incident became known around the school, and Tony got a bad reputation. So how horrible and unfair is that? Kids started calling her a slut and wild, and then she started acting out, smoking pot, drinking, and she became promiscuous, having sex with multiple partners. Now, Lori continued her friendship with Hope, and then they started being friends with Tony. The three of them became involved in self-mutilation, cutting their arms with razors. Lori was hospitalized at one point because she cut too deep and it wouldn't stop bleeding. Yeah, that's the risk of cutting. Yeah. You know, it's tough to know how deep to go. It's terrible. That's really sad. It sure is. After Lori got out of the hospital, she began spending a lot of time with Carrie in New Albany. Lori talked all the time about death and killing. She was disturbed. She claimed to channel spirits, and this started to frighten Carrie. So then Lori began spending more time with Melinda. Yeah, Carrie's mm -hmm. kind of stepping back from this stuff. She's a little good, uneasy good about call. what's going on. Yeah. She dodged a bullet here if she'd yeah. been in the group. She sure did. So the night of January 10th, 1992, we're getting into the, the This is the part. event, right, yeah. Tony Lawrence, who is 15, Hope Rippey, who is 15, Lori Tackett, who is 17, drove in Lori's car from Madison to Melinda Lovelace's house in New Albany, Indiana. Tony, who was a friend of Lori, had not previously met Melinda who was 16 at the time. So we've got a 17-year-old, a 16-year-old, and two 15-year-olds. Right. Now, Hope, though, had met her once before, and she'd gotten along well with her, and they were telling Tony, oh, you'll like her. Melinda. Melinda. They'll like Melinda. They'll okay. like Melinda. Okay. So they get there, they borrow some clothes from Melinda, 
She shows him a knife, telling him she's going to scare Shanda Sharer with it. Now, nobody had ever met Shanda, but Lori already knew the plan to intimidate her. Melinda explained to the other two girls that she hated Shanda for being a copycat and for stealing her girlfriend. Now, Lori let Hope drive the four girls to Shanda's dad's house, and they stopped at a McDonald's on the way to ask for directions. They arrived at Shanda's house just before dark. Melinda told Hope and Tony to go to the door to introduce themselves as friends of Amanda, then invite Shanda to come with them to see Amanda. They told Shanda that Amanda was waiting for them at the witch's castle. Now Shanda said that she couldn't go because her parents were awake. Now she's at her dad's house. Right. And she told the girls to come back around midnight and she'd sneak out. Now her dad had overheard the first part about these girls trying to get her to come out, and he kind of questioned her about it. But she told her dad that it was just some girls at the door who wanted her to go to the mall, and she'd said no. So the girls, they walked back down to Lori's car and told Melinda that Shanda couldn't come out. So Melinda was angry at first, but Hope and Tony assured her they'd come back later and get Shanda. So the four girls crossed the river to Louisville, Kentucky, and they attended a punk rock show by the band Sunspring. Now Tony and Hope were bored at the concert, and they went to the parking lot outside the skate park. And there they hooked up with a couple of boys in the car. Tony confided to the boy she was making out with that the two girls they came to the concert with were planning to kill someone that night. Now, yeah, I just met this girl and I'm making out with her. And she says, oh yeah, we're here to pick up some girl and kill her. But you really wouldn't believe it, right? I, no. Because kids say the, stupid things. That's what I'm getting at. Right. This is just too beyond belief. Yeah. So eventually the four girls did leave for Shanda's house again. And during the ride, Melinda said she couldn't wait to kill Shanda. But she also said she just intended to use the knife to frighten her, so she's going back and forth. And, and again, you're, you're thinking, we're not going to kill anybody, we're just going to scare the shit out of her. Right. Now, when they arrived at Shanda's house at 12.30 a.m., Tony refused to go and lure Shanda into the car, so Lori and Hope went to the door. Shanda was waiting for them by the side door, and she was looking happy to see them, so she was excited to see Amanda. But she'd left her purse in the house, so it seems like she was just going to go outside and maybe not leave the house. We're not sure. Yeah, we're not. But Melinda was hiding under a blanket in the back seat of the car, holding this dull knife that she'd brought with her. Shanda was unsure about her outfit for the occasion, so Hope volunteered to help her pick out some clothes. And then Hope actually went in the house with Shanda for a few minutes before she brought Shanda out to the car in a new outfit. Yeah. And, and maybe that was a reason to go get the purse or something? Maybe. And she decided, okay, I'll go with these girls? Yeah, but she, her purse was left there. It didn't okay. go with her. So, so she I just, don't know. just went in a chain. She may have forgotten it or she may have not planned on going. I don't know. But Shanda was sandwiched between Hope and Tony in the front seat. So once she was in, she wasn't getting out. Lori was very familiar with the witch's castle. She had taken Melinda and Amanda there before and claimed to feel the presence of witches there. Because remember, she, she says she has this psychic ability, channeling spirits thing right. going on. She has a bunch of spirits inside her. Right. So Hope talks to Shanda about Amanda. And she finally got her to say, got Amanda to say that she's going out with Amanda for about the past four months. So this is Melinda's cue. She jumps up from the rear seat, grabs Shanda by the hair, and puts the knife to her throat. And she asked Shanda if she was going with Amanda and demanded to know if she'd gone to the Harvest Homecoming with her. Now, Shanda tried to deny that she was seeing Amanda anymore, and she begged Melinda not to hurt her. Now, Melinda says, Amanda knows I'm going to kill you. She wants you dead as much as I do. Yeah. Well, after they pulled up at the witch's castle, Lori and Melinda grabbed Shanda by the arms, and they took her to the dungeon area. Melinda criticized Shanda's appearance as Hope taunted her with the knife. Lori tied Shanda's ankles with rope, while Melinda tied her wrists. They took off her jewelry, including her Mickey Mouse watch. They brought a t-shirt from the car that had a smiley face with a bullet in the head. Now Lori doused it with whiskey and set it on fire, and she said, that's what you're going to look like. Now Shanda's crying, and she's very frightened at this point, as you can imagine. I can only imagine. She must be terrified. And let's remember, she's only 12. She's really yeah, a kid. She's a baby. Yeah. 
So during this time, five or six cars have passed by. The, the girls got worried that someone would see the flames, so they decided to drive somewhere else. Lori said she knew of a, a private place near her house where they could go. So they dragged Shanda back to the car. Hope and Tony are in the front, Hope's driving. Shanda was in the back seat, wedged between Laura and Melinda. So they're driving along, Hope announces that they're running out of gas. So Shanda told her where there was a nearby gas station that would be open. This was near her home, so Shanda was probably just trying to get to a safe place. But before they pulled in, Lori covered Shanda with a blanket, and she and Melinda stayed on either side of Shanda to prevent her escape. Well, Hope pumped the gas while Tony went in to pay for it. They had to stop at another gas station to get directions to Jeffersonville, and from there they knew the way to Madison. They drove for about an hour on an isolated country road while Lori played some loud industrial punk music. Now Lori was acting very strangely, screaming and laughing. She was scaring Hope and Tony. Now as she screamed and laughed, Melinda was holding up the knife. She told Shanda she wasn't going to hurt her, she just wanted to talk. Now Shanda's just crying. She's inconsolable at this point. She's got to be terrified. Yeah. So they get to this wooded area, drive a little further down a logging road. So it's a dirt road, barely visible to anyone who had passed by. They got to a clearing and everyone got out of the car. So Shanda's begging them, please don't hurt me. Tony then asked Melinda to take Shanda back home. And Melinda told Tony, shut up. So Tony's becoming more and more afraid, and she and Hope got back into the car. So this leaves Lori and Melinda with Shanda. Yeah. So the, they watch as Lori and Melinda strip Shanda. Melinda ran back to the car with Shanda's clothes, and she told them that she was keeping them for souvenirs. Melinda grabbed one of Hope's other T-shirts and put it on Shanda, and Hope took Shanda's polka dot bra and put it on herself. She and Tony turned up the car radio and the boombox that was in the car to drown out the sounds coming from outside. But they were still watching through the windshield. Yeah. They might not have been actively engaged in, in the proceedings, but they were very much complicit. They were. And I wonder if they had cell phones, if maybe they would have. But it doesn't seem like it because they have other opportunities, we'll see, where they could have saved her. They sure did. So Lori encouraged Melinda. She held Shanda's arms behind her back as Melinda punched her. Shanda's mouth bled profusely as she begged them to stop. She'd just gotten braces a few weeks before. Melinda tried to cut Shanda's throat, but the knife was too dull. Hope then jumped out of the car and tried to hold Shanda down for them. Now Tony saw Lori sitting on Shanda's stomach and Melinda sitting on her legs. Lori was trying to strangle her as Shanda was fighting. Melinda gave Lori a piece of rope and helped her put it around Shanda's neck. And then the two of them, Melinda and Lori, pulled on each end of the rope around Shanda's neck until she was unconscious. So this is brutal. Very. Lori asked Tony for the keys to the trunk. Hope was back in the car and handed over the keys. Lori asked for help putting Shanda in the trunk, but only Melinda would help. Tony watched as Lori and Melinda opened the trunk. They dragged Shanda over and they put her in the trunk and there was a loud thud. So Hope starts to cry. Is she dead? And Melinda said yes. So they drive off, hit a log, and tore the muffler off the car. They stop at Lori's house, and she went into the kitchen, got some Pepsi for everyone to drink. There's blood on her coat. She washed it off in the bathroom. Now Hope and Tony wanted to go to sleep, and Lori's dog was barking, and then they heard Shanda screaming from the trunk. Lori said she'd take care of it. She took a small paring knife from the kitchen and ran outside. Now, when she returned, she had more blood on her, and Shanda had stopped screaming. So that's ominous. That's very ominous. Now, at this point, Hope or Tony could have called somebody, could have gotten help. Yeah, they're in the house. Yeah. The mother, Lori's mother's there. Yeah. All they had to do was say something. But they didn't. They didn't. I don't understand it. Now, after washing her hands again, Lori came back to the room she made a call, and she was overheard saying, It doesn't matter what I need it for, I just need it. Now, it was after 2.30 a.m., Lori wanted to go cruising through the country. Hope and Tony didn't want to go, so Melinda and Lori left together. They drove toward Canaan, a nearby town. Lori suggested that they continue just driving all night, and Shanda could die slowly in the trunk. So they drive down isolated country roads, 
Then Shanda started kicking and screaming, clawing at the inside of the trunk. So this is so cruel. It's I just yeah, can't get over it. I can't either. It's sickening. So Lori says again, I'll take care of it. She gets out of the car, and Melinda slides into the driver's seat. Lori opens the trunk, starts throwing punches, and Melinda's watching her in the rearview mirror. Shanda's continuing to scream. There's a brief struggle. There's a big thump. And then Lori slammed the trunk shut. Ugh. She was excited and she ran back to the passenger seat. You should have felt it, she told Melinda, as she banged a tire iron against the dashboard. It was so cool. I went like this and I could feel her head caving in. She asked Melinda to smell the tire iron, which is dripping with Shonda's blood. Melinda said, oh, that's gross, and she turns away. That's more than gross. This whole behavior so then they start, unbelievable. It is. Then the girls start talking about burning Shonda's body. They open the trunk to see her. They were shocked when she sat straight up. They could see the whites of her eyes. The rest of her was covered in blood. Her hair and skin were dark red. Both girls were, would say that Shonda said one word. And that was mommy. That is heartbreaking. Isn't it? They closed the trunk on her again, and then they stopped on a bridge with the intention of throwing her off of it, but they couldn't get her out of the trunk. Now headlights approached, and Lori quickly slammed the trunk, and they left again. Shanda continued to kick, but she was no longer screaming. They stopped and opened the trunk and looked at her again, and Shanda said, Melinda? So she's probably, you know, wanting to just beg for help. She's got to be in pain and just miserable. Has to be incredibly distressed. Yes. Bad. So bad. So it's starting to get light out, and Lori and Melinda returned to Lori's house. Hope and Tony woke up when the dog barked, and Hope asked Lori where the little girl was. Lori says, there's no little girl, it's just a nightmare. No. <laughs> but Lori and Melinda had blood on their hands. Yeah. Melinda had blood on her face, and they go to the bathroom to wash up. They come back. Lori is laughing and told him she had hit Shanda in the face with a tire tool. Melinda was bragging, too. She said that they must have hit her at least 60 times. Now, Lori's mother woke up and told Lori that her friends had to go home. The four girls got in the car, and they went to McDonald's for breakfast. Now Shanda's in the trunk. Yeah. Yeah. Still. So they drove to the burn pile near Lori's house and talked about burning her. Lori wanted to show Shanda's body to Hope and Tony, but only Hope would get out and look. And then Hope participated. She took a bottle of Windex from the trunk and sprayed it on Shanda and said, You're not looking so hot now, are you? Yeah, right. I know. Lori closed the trunk again, and they drove to a Clark gas station. Hope pumped the gas into the car. Tony wanted some Pepsi, and Lori told her to buy a two-liter bottle. So Tony sipped from the bottle, and then Lori took it away from her and poured the Pepsi out in the cement. She then filled the bottle with gas and gave it to Melinda. Now Hope got behind the wheel, and she suggested a place where they could burn Shanda's body. They drove about ten miles out of Madison, and Lori backed up into a cornfield. Tony was frightened and stayed in the back seat of the car, laying down and covering her face. The three others opened the trunk and looked at Shanda. Now they wrapped her in a blanket and lifted her onto the ground. So she's still alive. She's not speaking, but her hand is clutching the blanket. Yeah, she's still there. Yeah. So Hope pours gas on Shanda, and they light her on fire. Yep. They jump in the car to drive off. But Melinda told Lori to drive back because she was afraid the body wasn't burned enough. There was still some gas in the Pepsi bottle. Melinda poured it on Shanda's smoldering body and watched as it burst back into flames. She drops the bottle there. So she told the girls in the car that Shanda had been moving her tongue in and out of her mouth, and she laughed about it. Melinda says, I'm glad she's dead. I'm glad she's out of me and Amanda's life. Unbelievable. This is totally, one of the worst crimes totally. I've ever... what a horror story. Yeah. So by this time, it's 9.30 a.m., and they go back to McDonald's. While the others are at the counter, Tony called her friend, Mikkel, who was covering for her that night. She'd asked if her mom had called, looking for her. Mikkel noticed that Tony sounded really upset, and then Tony confessed that the girls she was with had killed Shanda. After they left McDonald's, Lori drove Hope and Tony home and she and Melinda returned to Lori's house. Lori's parents were eating breakfast at the table, and the girls sat down with them. Lori got her father to fix the muffler while Melinda was cleaning out the car. 
After the muffler was fixed, the two girls drove around to the side of the house and tried to spray the blood out of the trunk with a hose. Lori found a bloody piece of skin and looked at it, and she looked at Melinda and said, this is a piece of Shanda's head. Awful, I know. I'm, I'm just in shock. I know, and it's awful, and I hate to even repeat it, but if you don't, people don't know the horror of this, how bad it really was, right? I, I know, but that doesn't make it any better. Well, it doesn't at all, no. So Lori called Hope and found her in a panic. Hope was home alone and wanted them to come over. Now, when they got there, Hope was sitting on her bed crying, saying that she couldn't believe what they had done. She was holding Shanda's Mickey Mouse watch. They were able to calm her down before her mother came home, and then they watched TV with Hope's mother and infant nephew for about a half an hour. Then Lori and Melinda went back to Melinda's house in New Albany. They were at Melinda's house about 3 p.m., and no one else was home. Melinda called Amanda's house. Her dad said that Amanda was at the mall. So Melinda called the mall and had Amanda paged, and a few minutes later, Amanda called her back. Melinda asked Amanda if she could come and pick her up. She told her that Shanda was dead. Amanda didn't believe that, but she agreed to meet her. Now Melinda called her friend Crystal, who came over right away. She introduced Crystal to Lori, and they told Crystal the whole story of what they'd done to Shanda. So Crystal thought they were making this up until Lori showed her the knife that she'd taken from her mother's kitchen and said she'd used it to stab Shanda in the back of the head. All right, so Crystal ends up driving Melinda and Lori to meet with Amanda. Lori said she was too shaken to drive, and Melinda was too upset. So they, they get to Amanda's. They brought Amanda with them to Melinda's house, and they sit in the living room and go over the murder again. Melinda's crying hysterically, and she and Amanda went to her room to talk privately. So Melinda keeps asking Amanda if she's mad at her. Amanda said she wasn't. Amanda later says that she didn't believe that they had really killed Shanda. Lori didn't think that Amanda and Crystal were taking him seriously, so she wanted to show them the trunk of the car. Right. So that even though they had hosed it down, there's still blood all over the place. Well, of course, and yeah. They, they see bloody handprints inside the, the lid of the trunk. Yeah. Shanda's socks were still in there. They were soaked in blood. This is like a nightmare. Totally. So Melinda said, I just wanted to beat her up and scare her, but we got carried away. Yes. And Amanda felt sick to her stomach. She walked away thinking she was going to vomit, and she told them to take her home. So Lori drove, and the whole way she was giving the evil eye to Amanda in the rearview mirror. Yeah, this Lori's a scary girl. Right. Lori is very scary. When Melinda, Lori, and Crystal got back to Melinda's house, her stepdad was home. Melinda cried as they went over and over what they'd done, but Lori said she had no regrets. Steve Scherer, Shonda's dad, had been awake since 4.30 a.m., and he noticed that the back door was left open, so he pushed it closed and locked it. He looked for Shanda in her bedroom, and she wasn't there, so he figured she'd fallen asleep in the basement family room, something she'd done before. So he wasn't worried. He went back to sleep until around 7. Then he was up making coffee when his wife Sharon came in and asked about Shanda. Now, just one little thing here. Okay. You're up at 4.30 in the morning. The back door is unlocked, and you can't find your daughter. Or the back door is open, actually. Yeah. And you can't find your daughter. And he just figures, oh, she's in the basement, and he goes back to bed? Yeah. <laughs> That's weird. A little. I, I don't think I would have acted that way. Maybe not. I don't think it's that weird, though, if it's something she'd done before. He well, has no reason to be alarmed. Yeah, so, I, I, I guess, know. but still, it seems seems strange to me that he finds the door open and his daughter's gone. Right. And he just automatically assumes she's down in the basement sleeping. Right. But whatever. So he's he's asleep. He, he gets up around 7. Right. He's making coffee, and Sharon asks, where's Shonda? Yeah, and Steve says he thought she was downstairs, but he hadn't checked. So Sharon goes downstairs and looks. Steve wonders if he had locked her out when he closed the door. Yeah, like if she'd stepped out and left the door open to come right back in and he'd locked it, she'd be locked out. Yeah, then you would knock on the door and say, Dad, let me in. I would <laughs> hope so. <laughs> anyway. So, well, they went outside and looked in their car and their van, and Shanda wasn't there. So he called Michelle's house, thinking she might have gone there overnight. 
and when he continued calling her friends, none of them had seen her. At 1 p.m. that day, he finally called Shanda's mother, Jackie. Seems like a long time to me. It is. She came right over, and they, they filed a missing persons report together. After filing the report, Shanda's parents drove around New Albany in the Hazelwood School area searching for her. Now, Don Foley and his brother Ralph were out quail hunting that day when they discovered Shanda's body. Now, at first, it looked like a pile of burned-up rags, but as they walked closer, they finally realized it was the burnt body of a girl. Yeah, I guess they, they thought it was a mannequin or something. I hear that all the time. But, yeah. you know, people, it's just the mind, I guess, not wanting to believe it's a human body, because you hear yeah. all the time people saying, well, I thought it was a mannequin or a doll. Right. It's wishful thinking, I guess. It probably is. So Shonda's face and upper body were burned beyond recognition. There is some skin visible on her legs, but they were bloody and cut. And Shonda was nude except for a pair of blue underwear. There was a pool of blood underneath her head, and her legs were slightly bent, and her hands were raised in a position often seen in fire victims. Yeah, I guess they call it the boxer position. Yeah. The body kind of curling up on itself. Yeah. Ugh. I know. So investigators believe that the underwear was pulled to the side and she was posed in a sexual way prior to being set on fire. Yeah. So it's not enough to do all they've done to her. No. They may have sexually abused her. Yes, and that's something that the girls didn't mention in their statements, but in the autopsy report, it seemed like she'd been sodomized with something. It certainly does. Awful. So there were tire tracks and a single shoe print that investigators were able to cast, and similar tire tracks at an intersection about a tenth of a mile down the road matched the tracks near Shanda's body. So detectives believed they would find conclusive evidence once they found the car and got a search warrant. Now that evening, a 15-year-old boy came down to the jail, and he reported a conversation he'd overheard at the local bowling alley. He'd heard two girls saying that they had witnessed a murder. Now, they were bragging, but they seemed agitated and nervous. Just minutes later, Tony Lawrence was at the sheriff's department with her parents. Now, she was hysterical, speaking in disconnected phrases. She told them that the victim was 13 and her name was Shanda. Now, she didn't know the other girls' last names or ages, but she did remember Shanda's address. So it looks like Tony has some remorse. I think she does, but, you know, she had a chance to do something. Maybe too little too late, but at least she told her parents, and they did the right thing. Right. Brought her down to well, the police station. So police did identify Shanda through her dental records, and then they had the horrible job of notifying her parents. Right. That, that must have been, well, I, I don't even want to think about it. Yeah. So that afternoon... Melinda's mother, Marjorie, comes home. She finds Melinda and Lori watching TV in the living room. Now, Melinda kept harassing Marjorie until she agreed to let Lori spend the night. Melinda ended up acting very strangely that evening, hiding up in her room with Lori. Now, at 2.30 in the morning, police pull up at the Loveless home to arrest Lori and Melinda. They beat down the front door, according to Marjorie. Mm -hmm. She just broke right in. Sure told Marjorie that the girls were being arrested for murder. Girls were asleep. They said nothing as they dressed and were led outside to the police cars. And Marjorie, sitting there, stunned and confused, because she has no clue. Right. But, you know, it's just a nightmare. And I, I would see they would break in. This is a very serious crime. And how did these girls go to sleep? I know. After doing that? I mean, they, Something wrong with they're, them. They're just carrying on like nothing's happened. Pretty they much. go to McDonald's, they hang around watching TV. Yeah. Just acting totally normal. Well, Lori and Melinda seemed to be very different people to the police. Melinda was meek, but she tried to be seductive with the policeman. And she seemed to be used to manipulating people with her good looks. They thought that Lori was much more intelligent, but she was tough and had little remorse. Shanda's autopsy noted lacerations on her head, neck, and legs, ligature marks on her wrists and her ankles. So it was found in her airway, so now we know that she was alive when she was set on fire. And the cause of death was smoke inhalation and burns. So if she had been saved before they set her on fire, if one of the girls had done something, 
She probably could have been saved. Possibly. I mean, they beat the shit out of her. They did. So, I'm not sure. But, uh, yeah, the, the fire definitely... That's what did it. You're right. Now, the torture and murder of Shanda left the community in shock. 13-year-old Jeffrey Stettenbenz told police that he had had a three-way phone conversation just days earlier with Melinda and Amanda. Melinda had told them that she was going to kill Shanda. Police searched Shanda's room and found letters which implied a love triangle between Amanda, Melinda, and Shanda. Now, five days after Shanda's body was found, detectives interviewed Amanda. She tried to downplay her relationships with both Shanda and Melinda, but finally she admitted that Melinda had called her that Friday evening. And during their conversation, Melinda told her that she was at a concert with Tony, Hope, and Lori. The next day, when she was at the mall, she was paged to the customer service office for an emergency phone call, and she told them about being picked up by Melinda, Crystal, and Lori that Saturday, and then they told her about Shanda and showed her the trunk. A tenant who lived in a trailer on Lori Tackett's family's property told police that he saw a car at the burn pile at 3 o'clock Saturday morning. The car drove between the burn pile and the Tackett house twice. Lori knocked on his door that morning, and she's asking for change to buy Coke from a, from a machine that was on the property. And he said she was visibly shaken. So in late January, Shanda's mom, Jackie, went through her things. She found a shoebox that was tied with string and had For My Eyes Only written on it. In the box, she found letters from Amanda to Shanda. And in the letters, Amanda complimented Shanda and professed her love for her. So Jackie interprets these letters as being manipulative of her 12-year-old daughter. Yeah, she really felt that way. Now, a psychological evaluation of Lori Tackett said she suffered from depression with paranoid and antisocial behaviors. She was intelligent and delusional. She probably had an alcohol abuse problem. She claimed to suffer from blackouts and had amnesia of the events of Shanda's murder. So to me, that's just convenient. She had visual and auditory hallucinations, and they, she also claimed to have multiple personality disorder. She actually acted out different personalities. Right. She had a history of self-mutilating, and she was suicidal. And she also claimed to be psychic. Now, the report concluded that she was desperate to avoid conviction and was faking a lot of these symptoms. So I guess she didn't fool the examiners. No. In exchange for her cooperation, Tony Lawrence was allowed to plead guilty to one count of criminal confinement, and she was sentenced to a maximum of 20 years. In August, she overdosed on lorazepam and was in the ICU for 11 days with adult respiratory distress syndrome. She ended up needing to be ventilated. Yeah, but she did recover, and after that she spent some time in a mental health facility. Yeah, so felony murder charges were filed against the three other girls. They all signed plea agreements in order to avoid the death penalty. So Lori and Melinda were sentenced to 60 years in the Indiana Women's Prison in Indianapolis. With maximum time reduced for good behavior, they could be released as early as 2022. Did we mention that they were all tried as adults? No, but or, when you say 60 years, we know. <laughs> that's true. Right? Yeah. So Hope Rippey was also sentenced to 60 years with 10 years suspended for mitigating circumstances, plus 10 years of medium supervision probation. On appeals, the judge reduced her sentence to 35 years. So Tony Lawrence, who got... Criminal confinement charge. Criminal confinement. Uh, she served nine years. She was released on December 14, 2000, and she was on parole until December 2002. And on April 28, 2006... Hope Rippey was released from Indiana Women's Prison on parole after serving 14 years of her original sentence, and she remained on supervised parole for five years. So Melinda and Lori are still in. Yes. So there was an episode in the fifth season of Law & Order, Special Victims Unit, called Mean, which was based on this murder. And the Cold Case second season had an episode called The Sleepover, that was more loosely based on this crime. In an interview with Shanda Sher's mother, Jackie Voigt, on the TV series Deadly Women, Voigt stated that Sher's father was so destroyed by his daughter's murder 
that he did everything he could to kill himself beside put a gun to his head, and that he drank himself to death. The man definitely died from a broken heart, she said. Yeah, now, that's one of the additional sadness things of, of this whole sad experience. Well, because these things never just affect the people involved. They, it all branches out. Right. They're like little capillaries of pain going out to everyone that knew them and loved them. And, and he did, in fact, drink himself to death. Yes. He was only 53. Yeah. Now, in 2011, Dr. Phil had the two-part series on the crime, and this featured Shanda Shear's mother and sister, who both harshly confronted Hope Rippey on the show, which Hope Rippey was kind of making excuses for herself. And she did some bad shit. She did. Yeah, she's the one that poured the gas on her the first yeah, time. She, she was not an innocent bystander. No. I mean, I can sort of see Tony, because she really didn't do anything. But but sometimes doing nothing is just as bad as well, doing something. Yeah, we, you mentioned that. Right. But Hope was an active participant. She was. And then they also had an interview with Amanda Heverin, and Shanda's mother definitely blamed Amanda for her part in manipulating Shanda and causing these events to happen. Now, during Melinda Lovelace's sentencing hearing, extensive court testimony revealed that her father, Larry Lovelace, had abused his wife, his daughters, and other children. He was arrested in February 1993 on charges of rape, sodomy, and sexual battery. Most of the crimes occurred between 1968 and 1977. Now, Larry remained in prison for over two years awaiting trial. A judge eventually ruled that all charges except one count of sexual battery had to be dropped due to the statute of limitations, which was five years in Indiana. Now, Larry pleaded guilty to the one count of sexual battery, but he just received a sentence of time served, and he was released in June 1995, so that didn't turn out to be much. No, and, and then a few weeks following his release, he unsuccessfully sued the Floyd County Jail for $39 million. This was in federal court. He alleged he had suffered cruel and unusual punishment during his two-year incarceration. Among his complaints were that he was not allowed to sleep in his bed during the day or to read the newspaper. <laughs> yeah, right. Please. Well, I'm glad that that was unsuccessful. <laughs> yeah. So the Shonda Share Scholarship Fund was established in 2009, and this fund plans to provide scholarships to two students per year from the Prosser School of Technology in New Albany. One scholarship will go to a student who is continuing his or her education, and the other scholarship will go to a student who is beginning his or her career and must buy tools or other work equipment. According to the rules of the fund, the scholarship recipient will also be given a plaque or a document of some type that tells Shanda Shearer's story. So that's nice when people try and have something good after something horrible like that happens. Yeah, and, and here's something else that might be good. In 2012, Shanda Shearer's mother, Jackie Vaught, made her first contact with Melinda since the trials, although in an indirect manner. Vought donated a dog for Loveless to train for the Indiana Canine Assistance Network program, ICANN, which provides service pets to people with disabilities. Now, Melinda's been training dogs for this program for several years. So Jackie said she has endured criticism over the decision, but defends it by saying, It's my choice to make. Shonda's my child. If you don't let good things come from bad things, nothing gets better. And I know what my child would want. My child would want this. So she says she hopes to donate a dog every year in honor of Shonda. Yeah, well, in the recent interviews that you find in YouTube, Melinda does seem like she's changed. Yeah, she does. I mean, she's doing good work. She is, and she seems to have real remorse. Yeah. And you can think of her childhood and have some sympathy for her. I certainly can. Now, Lori, not so much. No. Seems like her childhood, she was treated a little bit better, and she's really shown no remorse, and she's had lots of trouble in prison as well. Well, she was the one that had a diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder. Yeah. So those those are tough ones. Yeah, and she's the one that didn't really seem too upset about anything no, when this happened. Not in the least. Okay, so I know you're anxious to get to feedback. We have a lot of feedback. But before that, I'd just like to talk a little bit about what's happening with Team Tie Grabber. 
In our members-only feed, we're in the midst of covering honeymoon murders, or as Dick likes to call it, honeymoon death experiences, <laughs> or something like that. Okay. Two weeks ago, we covered the disappearance of George Smith on his honeymoon on a cruise ship. That was a big mystery, and we also had some fun talking about cruises and phobias in general. And uh, Dick, do you have an update on our civil action cases from Carnival and Royal Caribbean corporations? No. No? No updates? Okay. Not well, keep me up to date on that. I'll, I'll keep checking. Okay. Later this week, we're releasing an episode on the case of Annie Gawani. Annie was killed by a carjacker back in 2010 on her honeymoon in South Africa. There were accusations that her husband planned the murder and hired the killers. We're talking about her family and also what other people think of this. Now, we've built up a nice collection of these members-only podcasts, so if you join Tie Grabber, you can download them all, and you can have a binge. And then you can get a new one every, well, two to four weeks. It kind of varies how often we put one out, but we try and do it more than once a month, although we've promised at least once a month. Now, joining Tie Grabber is breezy. Just go to tiegrabber.com, and you can sign up with PayPal. You can also offer support on Patreon, And you can listen to the members-only episodes there as a patron. There's also the free way to give us some support. The next time you shop on Amazon, go in through the link on tiegrabber.com. It's right below the most recent episode. And then Amazon will give us a tiny kickback from purchases that you would have made anyway. We won't know what you've bought and the prices won't be any different. So this is a very seamless way to provide some support for the podcast. If you have some feedback for us, you can contact us at truecrimebrewery at tiegrabber.com. We're also on Twitter at tiegrabberpods. We're on Instagram and we're on Facebook. We have an amazing Facebook group, True Crime Brewery Fan Discussions, where you can give me suggestions. You can also chat with other true crime addicts and regulars of The Quiet End. I read all feedback and I try and get to every topic on the show. Thank you so much for all of you who support us. We really do appreciate it. We certainly do. And most of all, just thank you for listening. That's the best thing you can do. Everything else is just like frosting on the cake. Right. And I feel guilty for asking for more, but WTF. Please give us a five-star review on iTunes if you haven't already, and tell your friends about the podcast. That takes care of my shameless self-promotion. Now let's hear some music and get to the feedback. Let's do it. Sometimes it's never quite enough If you're flawless Then you're in my love Don't forget to win Welcome to Feedback, and Dick's going to start today. I'm going first, okay. So I have a letter from Michelle from Indiana, and she's talking about the Beaumont children. That was our last episode. Yep. The kids in Australia who disappeared. So she says, Hi, Jill and Dick. I think I may be able to shed some light onto why these children went willingly and quietly with a stranger. I also grew up in the 60s. This was a time when we were taught to respect our elders, period. So we were also given the talk about strangers. However, a stranger was not a normal-looking person to a child. So we thought of strangers as sinister-looking people. The man last seen with the Beaumont children was described as a surfer type who blended into society. Now, he obviously had earned their trust. You didn't hear about these crimes back then, so they had no reason to be suspicious of him. Adults were always safe. Isn't Mm -hmm. that the truth? I think so, yeah. It's probably true. Michelle goes on. Also, I had to chuckle during a discussion about parenting types. I can remember taking my eight-year-old and her friend to a local pool in the early 90s. 
She was not aware that I always carried a pair of binoculars in my purse and monitored everything as she went about learning to be independent <laughs> and going to the restroom, concession stand, etc. That's clever. Alone with her friends. She was never out of my sight at that age, but she didn't know it. Very good. It's very clever. I like that. And it helped build her confidence while keeping her mom from worrying. I felt it was a win-win situation. Today she's a self-sufficient 34-year-old who purchased her first house at age 25 and lives alone. We really have to have balance when parenting, don't we? That's true, but it's a tough balance. It is. Yeah. I mean, it's tough sometimes to not intervene. Mm-hmm. And it's tough sometimes to intervene. Absolutely. So, but that's a great letter from Michelle. Yes, I like that. I, I think we all have stories. If if we were children of the 60s, we all have stories about raising our own kids and how we dealt with things going on with them. Right, yeah. So thank you, Michelle. Thanks, Michelle. So I have a letter from Della Grazia, and this goes back a little ways to Fatal Exposure, the murder of Travis Alexander by Jody Arias. Well, that is a way back one. It is, but even well, if you haven't heard back. our episode, you've probably heard of the case. Very famous case. Yeah. The fact that Jody Arias molded herself and her boyfriend's interests became hers and absorbed that, his identity, is a characteristic of one with low self-esteem and also one who had no family and feels an intense need to have one to belong to. I can't help wondering why he was attracted to a psychopath, but I'm sure it's got something to do with his childhood. What do you think? I think that's true. He had a very tough childhood. He, he did. He had a pretty crappy childhood. His mother was terrible to him. So they always say you uh, you marry your parent or whatever that saying is. Yeah. No, I, I think that there is definitely some issues with old Travis that made him want to go out with a girl like Jody. I agree. And and not just to go out with her, but even after they had broken up, to keep seeing her and having sex with her. And there was something that made him want to break away as well. Yeah. So he, he was kind of messed up himself. He was. Very sad, though. Because he was trying. Well, yeah, kind of. Yeah. I mean, if he's... No, nah, I'm, I'm not going to speak ill of the dead, but I'd just say if he's really trying, he would have no contact with her at all. Sure. And when she comes into his house sneaking through the pet door, or however she got in... <laughs> yeah, that is sick. ...calls the police and files a restraining order against her. I know, but it's always easy afterwards to it tell is. people what he, they should have done, so let's go. not go there. Hindsight again. Right. All right, I got another one about the Beaumont children from ABW. Ugh, the mentioning of parents of missing children holding out faith for their children's return, living in the same houses, keeping the same phone number, etc., in case they come looking for home again one day, is absolutely just heart-wrenching, isn't it? Yes. Even the disappearance of my cat had left me completely heartbroken, and it killed me inside to have to move from the house shortly thereafter. She says I even had dreams about his returns or of looking for him. That was years after he'd gone. So I can't even imagine what one would feel after their own child just disappears. Tragic beyond words. The not knowing and wondering would be just completely heart-wrenching. Totally. We are in total agreement. I could have nothing but sympathy for the Beaumont parents. So Michelle H. wrote just a little blurb about her Girl Scout days. She said, I was a Brownie Scout during this time, and this was the Girl Scout murders we were talking about that was in the 70s. Yeah, in, yeah. in Oklahoma. Yeah. And she said that this caused the cancellation of her camping stay that would have been a week later. Not in the same place, but it was in Nebraska. So it did affect other Girl Scout troops. Yeah, oh, yeah. It most definitely did. There was a public reaction to that. That was a horrific crime. Wasn't it? Yeah, I think it changed the way that they do those sorts of things as well. Oh, no question. So, do you have another one, or you want me to go again? Um, I can do another one, because I have some shorter one? ones. Because I'm easing ahead of you. Yeah, and you have a lengthy one. Yeah. So, I have one from Kate L. It's a suggestion. The case of Malcolm Webster, an Englishman convicted of the murder of his first wife and the attempted murder of his second wife, is worth covering. PBS released a miniseries on the case, and it's called The Widower. Oh, so what's that about? I watched it. It's a great miniseries. It's a three-parter. It's a three-part true story of Malcolm Webster, an infamous wife killer. 
he marries and then attempts to kill a succession of women to mask his debts and cash in on their life insurance policies. Webster was a nurse by profession, and on the surface he was a perfect gentleman, well-spoken, personable, and oozing with charm, he marries his first wife, Claire, in 1993. However, a year after her dream wedding, Claire is dead, the apparent victim of a tragic road accident. What no one knows at the time is that Webster has spent the entire marriage plying his unsuspecting wife with sedatives. He aims to keep her in a constant state of fatigue and drowsiness to prevent her from questioning his wild spending habits or mounting debts. But as debtors are closing in on him, he decides to silence his wife once and for all by killing her in a staged car accident that will pay him a life insurance policy that will resolve his financial difficulties. So he does that, and then he marries another woman and attempts to do the same thing to her. Well, it worked the first time. But her parents figure out what he's doing, and he takes off. Huh. And then he just tries to start doing it with another woman. So, yes, I definitely want to cover that. Thank you, Kate. That sounds interesting. Me again. Okay. So this is from Elizabeth P. It's a suggestion. Have you ever heard of the Krista Worthington case on Cape Cod? It would be a great subject. Well, yes, we have heard of this. Yes. So Krista Worthington was raped and stabbed to death at her home in Truro, which was on Cape Cod, in 2002. Her body was found with her two-year-old daughter, Ava, clinging to it. The child was unharmed. In April of 2005, the local garbage collector, Christopher McCowan, was arrested and charged with her rape and murder. On November 2006, he was found guilty in Barnstable Superior Court of first-degree murder, rape, and burglary, and was sentenced to life without parole. In January 2008, a hearing was held due to three jurors' separate allegations that racism was involved in the deliberations. I guess we should add here that Krista was a Caucasian and Christopher McCowan was African-American. But in December 2010, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court denied this appeal for a new trial. So he's still in jail doing life in prison without parole. Yeah. It's an interesting case. It is. So I think we should look into that. Sure. Now, Jodell W. also wrote in with a suggestion. She said, look up the Tom Niblo murder in Abilene, Texas. It happened the first week of December, I believe. Strange, strange murder of a prominent person, and our police will never solve it. This was recent. Yeah, so I read a bit about this. The death of 54-year-old Niblo occurred on December 12, 2016. He was shot and killed inside his home in an act that police believe wasn't random. His wife and dog managed to escape unharmed. An autopsy report from the Tarrant County Medical Examiner's Office showed Niblo's death was caused from being shot in the head, face, abdomen, torso, left and right extremities, and left and right legs. Well, someone expended a lot of bullets on this sure guy. Sure did. After months of being unable to make any headway with the case, police have listed it as cold. His brother-in-law, Luke Sweetser, was the only suspect in the case. Huh. So that might be worth looking into. Very yeah. interesting. I mean, that almost sounds like he was being tortured before being killed. Yeah, I depending mean, on where they shot first, right? Gunshot wounds to all extremities. Some it Sounds like someone who knew him for sure. Yeah. Oh, let's let's check that one, too. So I have one final one it's from Rebecca, who's commenting on missing children. I guess related to the Beaumont case, but not just that one. So Rebecca says, resources are scarce for families of missing children. The government offers a guide when your child is missing, a family survival guide, and some private support groups exist. She also says an organization called Project Hope helps connect families of missing children. And she goes on to say, accusations from the public can make the mental anguish of losing a child even worse for many parents. And she goes on to describe a case involving a lady named Beth Eubank. So these comments may have led to her daughter's suicide and a harsh legal battle. Beth's two-year-old grandson went missing in 2006. Twelve days later, the boy's mother, who is Eubank's daughter, Melinda, killed herself. She reportedly penned a suicide note addressed to the public in which she said she had felt faced with ridicule and criticism following a disappearance. So one person who confronted Melinda was Nancy Grace. She featured Melinda on her show. 
and when Melinda couldn't answer or wouldn't answer Grace's questions about where she had been before the dis disappearance of her child, Grace said, you're not telling us for a reason. What's the reason you refused to give even the simplest facts of where you were with your son before he went missing? Then she killed herself the next day. Her family sued CNN and Grace for intentional infliction of emotional distress. The parties eventually settled for undisclosed amounts. Their grandson, Trenton, would be 13 now, and he's still missing. So he is reported at age two to be missing by his mother. A screen window in Trenton's bedroom had been cut out, but no other evidence of any type was found. An Amber Alert was called. Bloodhounds were brought in, but there's no trace of the missing child, and to this day he remains missing. Rebecca says this might be a case you'd like to cover. She goes on to say there's some bizarre facts not necessarily connected to Trenton's disappearance. It was learned that Melinda made and sold some amateur softcore porn, including at least one photo involving a baby's crib and a video with the sound of the baby crying in the background. There's at least one video also involving the father of the baby, Josh. Okay. Josh's own father, James, was a former police officer, and he's on death row for the rape and murder of an 11-year-old girl at the time of the disappearance. So there are many people who say that James Duckett was wrongly convicted of the crime, which is a story all its own. There's many people that believe that Melinda did not commit suicide at all, citing the fact that she didn't use her own loaded and available shotgun, but an old gun and ammunition that hadn't been fired in 20 years. So it's alleged that there's a statement taken from a 14-year-old girl that affirms her as seeing Trenton the day after he disappeared in a Wendy's with his father, Josh. Well, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on there. There's a lot to it, and I do remember some of this case. Um, there was a lot of suspicion after she killed herself that maybe she had killed her son, and that's why she killed herself as well. well I'm sure, that would be the easy assumption, right? Yeah, I guess. So there certainly is a lot to that one. Yeah, sounds fascinating. Yeah. So thank you, Rebecca. So I have one last from our friend Veronica in Sweden. She's written to us before. Hi, Dick and Jill. Just listened to the podcast on the Beaumont children, and it was a good one, as usual. It's so sad that they never found any trace of the children. I think they were murdered that same day. In the feedback section, you briefly touched on the case of the Danish inventor, Peter Madsen. We are just fascinated with that. Yes, but so, we didn't even know where he was from. or. Yeah, we did. Oh, we did. Okay. He's Danish. Or I didn't. Maybe I didn't. Okay. Okay, so the case of Danish inventor Peter Madsen, who's accused of killing and dismembering the Swedish journalist Kim Wall. From what I've read in the Swedish media, the Danish police are looking at him for the disappearance of seven women in Copenhagen back in the 1980s and 90s. They all disappeared near where he worked and went to school. I just thought you'd like to know. So that's interesting, because we are interested in this case. Well, I'm fascinated by this case. And it would seem, if, if what we've learned about this latest one with the Swedish journalist, if those are all true facts, I would think that he'd been doing this kind of stuff previously. Yeah. She's not his first. No, I think that's how the police feel about it as well. Also, by the way, have you ever read about a Swedish self-proclaimed serial killer and hoaxer, Thomas Quick? I think there's a documentary on him on Netflix. He is one sick puppy. I would really love to hear Dick's take on him with all the benzodiazepines they fed him and how that impacts the brain. Well, sure. Let's look that up. Yeah. Keep the podcast coming my way, my fellow vegans and dog lovers. You are the best. All right. Yeah. So thanks, Veronica. We will definitely look up Thomas Quick. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Because that's a totally new one to me. Me too. Yeah. Sounds like a good day. We had some... Good feedback. I thought that was an interesting case. We get the best feedback. I love reading the feedback. Yeah. I could just do that all day. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get started. No, but it is great. I really appreciate everyone writing in because it gives us a lot to think about, gives us ideas. And I love the interaction instead of us just putting out episodes and people listening. Yeah. It's nice to have the feedback. Well, I, I like that. To interact. It, it a helps bit. us. Yeah. Well, I'm hoping we'll meet some of these people when we go to CrimeCon. I'm sure we will. That'll be really fun. We'll have to find some nice beer bars around there. Set I, I a meetup. I got a bunch of listings for Nashville. All right, good. So, 
Get ready. Yeah, so I hope some of you will make it down to CrimeCon and meet up with us. We'll see you there. Yep. Well, thank you for listening as always, and we will see you at the quiet end. Goodbye, folks. Bye-bye.